Lloyd Harav, Kvod Dr. Lan, Vrashay Yeshiva, Kvod Rabbanim Nechbadim, Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Gruss, our honored guests and other honored guests, colleagues and students. The yeshiva is the heart of Yeshiva University. The Beis HaMedrash is the heart of our yeshiva. It throbs with life and learning. It is our place of being a mailing batora, our house of study. It is alive in the spirit of our faith, day and night. I was here last night when we did not have a dedication, and it was a thrill to see the students, the smicha program, post smicha in the college and the high school studying. It was close to 11 o'clock at night at every table in this Beis HaMedrash. And this was after the Seder which the high school students have each evening. Kevin de Mekadme on the Chashchalavei Knishte Heine de Mahanalehu because of its daily and almost 24-hour use, this base of Medrash showed even more wear and tear than other parts of this building, which is now more than 50 years old. Mr. Gruss told me a moment ago, and we will have to search our archives, that we should have taken a picture before and a picture after and then you would really know how we have changed. Even as in our study of Torah, which requires chidush, renewal, so did this Beis HaMedrash require renewal. You can see for yourselves the walls and the floor and the ceiling and the lighting and the air conditioning and the furniture even the spirit has been renewed. You can admire the beauty of the parochas, which casts its glow over the entire Beis HaMidrash. Thus we gather for the Hanukkah Sabayas and to express our gratitude to this gentleman and his wife who made all of this possible to Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Gruss. Our Chazal point out that Yosef was more than a ruler. He was more than a loyal son of Israel. He was a man of chesed, of loving kindness. They stress the Hasidus of Yosef. Many of the students here can testify to the internal and external beauty of the Gruss Institute in Yerushalayim where you have studied. Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Gruss are responsible for that beautiful edifice and for its learning as well. And I'm pleased to tell them in the presence of the students that we have a larger group going this coming year than we have ever had and it is continuing to grow and indeed it will be a meaningful Torah Center for us in the Holy Land. Now you can add students to your gratitude to Mr. and Mrs. Gruss, this beautiful Beis HaMedrash. He stands first amongst all Jews in the country and in the world in recognition of Torah institutions as a recipient of his largesse, the Masim Tovim, you all know that Yosef was not the Bechor, but in this he is the Bechor. He stands first. And so I am happy that you are here, the students who use this Abbas Medrash, a few of our guests we are pleased to have 
Mr. Saul Litt, who serves almost as a partner to Mr. Groose in his enterprise on behalf of Torah institutions, people from the Federation, members of our boards, Dr. Schiff, who is a member of our Board of Reeks, as well as the head of the Board of Jewish Education, and Cy Brickman, Rabbi Brickman, one of our Musmachim, the whole delegation from the yeshiva of Kamenetz in Brooklyn has a much longer name, but I still know it as Kamenetz, Rabbi Siegel and the Balabatim, who have come to pay tribute to Mr. Gruss. I'd like to also pay a word of tribute to Mr. Blazer and the people who work to make certain that all of this would be as beautiful as it is, and then our own family. Dear friends, I present the Rosh Yeshiva, our president, Dr. Nachum Lam. Kvod Marenu Varabeno Shlita. Worthy Rasha Yeshiva, Rabbanim, our guests of honor, Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Gross, distinguished guests from many institutions from all over the city, and fellow students in the base Medrash. It's a genuine pleasure for me to offer my greetings to Mr. and Mrs. Gross and to the entire assemblage at this wonderful occasion when we are here to dedicate this better kabayas, this renewed and refur refurbished and beautiful Beis HaMedrash. There is no reason in the world why a Beis HaMedrash should not be beautiful. I'm especially pleased because I make comparisons, as is inevitable, of the time that I spent all my days and very many nights in this Beis HaMedrash, and never was it anything as beautiful as this. Not only that, I compare what this base Medrash looked like last year in this time, or six months ago, to what it is now. The difference is great. The atmosphere is so much more pleasant, so much more conducive to study, that on behalf of the students who use this base Medrash day and night, and as Rabbi Miller said, this is a place that is crowded and used by day and by night. On behalf of all of them, we offer our warmest thanks to Mr. and Mrs. Gruss for having made it possible for us to have Torah Ugdula B'makom Mechad. Torah and greatness, almost luxury in the aesthetic sense and in the functional sense, in one place. Mr. and Mrs. Gruss, as all of you are aware, are famous people. I'm not speaking of Joe Gruss's fame and finances as a genius or wizard in that area. That's a different area of fame. I'm speaking of fame as a Baal Chesed, a Baal Tzedakah, fame as a philanthropist. He has made a great, a great name for himself, a historic one, in the annals of Jewish Tzedakah. Now the striving to make a name for yourself, to leave something, is a very worthy one. Nowadays we use the term heroic for it. There is a search for the heroic. People want, in some way, something to survive them. They want to put their imprint on the world in a way which will help them overcome our own inevitable mortality, our own finitude. We want to live on in some This is a very worthy and very noble effort, and it's coming to all of us. And there are different ways of achieving it. Some people, in frivolous ways, other people in infamous ways, in evil ways, others in ineffectual ways, but there are some people who have this heroic urge to live on and on through great creative deeds that they do. And tzedakah is one of those creative ways. Through tzedakah is the way of Mr. and Mrs. Gross. More important, what they have done, not only in refurbishing, refurbishing this base medrash, and not only in the magnificent work they have done in the Gruss Institute in Yerushalayim, which, as Rabbi Miller has pointed out, 
in the three years of his existence is coming into the third year, every year grows, and this year more than ever before this coming year. But what he has done for communists and for the city at large through his magnificent efforts to put together a massive sum for Chinuch, what he has done for Chinuch is genuinely historic. And through this he has enabled countless young Jews and Jewesses to be able to do the same thing for themselves, to make an imprint on Jewish life, to give it an added impetus of creativity and constructiveness and vitality. He has enabled young Jews to do their own heroic thing, as it were, by becoming B'nai Torah. Let me explain. We're almost uh, about to celebrate one of our great holidays, Shavuos. On Shavuos, we read a Megillah, the book of Ruth. And in the book of Ruth, we're told that Ruth finally met Boaz, who was ultimately, soon thereafter, that is, destined to become her husband. And she was a widow, and there was an inheritance that had to be claimed. And in those days, the closest relative had the responsibility and the right to redeem that heritage, and in that way also to marry the widow. Boaz told Ruth that he could not marry her until this closer relative was the one who redeemed the inheritance. And we read that he met him, and he called out to him in interesting words. He said to him, Sura Shvapo Ploni Almoni. Come over here, sit down here. Ploni Almoni. There's no translation in English. So and so. What's your name? It, it's, it's, a, it's a label for one who has no label. So and so, Ploni Almoni. And Chazal point out that here is a man who was not given a name in Torah. He was punished apparently. Otherwise, there are so many minor characters who are named in the Torah. Why was this Goel, this Redeemer, this relative not named? Apparently, it was a punishment because he didn't want to marry Ruth. And one wonders at the harshness of this decree. After all, the man had good intentions. He didn't want uh, necessarily to marry this stranger. Maybe he didn't want to marry her. He didn't want his children to be involved in this entire process, which may have been bad for his family. Besides, Chazal say Tov Shmo, his name was Tov, which means good. Why was he punished by this enforced anonymity that instead of being called by his name, he was called Ploni Almoni? And the answer, I believe, is again with the Medrash, that the rabbis say the word Almoni, the first three letters, Aleph Lamed Mem, from the word Elaim, dumb or mute. Shehaya Elaim Midivrei Torah. He was mute when it came to Torah. His voice was never heard when it came to Torah. His actions were never noticed when it came to Torah. When it came to the world of Jewish creativity, at that moment he suddenly turned dumb. One didn't hear a word from him. And the rabbis were telling us, for a Jew if there is no Torah, then there is no name. If there is no Torah, there is no survival, there is no heroism. Genuine Jewish heroism means to do something in Torah, about Torah, something which will give Jews the opportunity to learn and to thrive in Torah. If there is Torah, then there is heroism and there is a great name. Mr. and Mrs. Gross, you have provided for our students, for our high school students who are here every night of the week, for our college students and for our Smitha students and Kola students, you have uh, provided for them a beautiful, an aesthetic, a pleasant ambiance for helping our students themselves emerge out of the crowd, out of anonymity, and to make a name for themselves in Torah. This is a Bismedrash which is fully used, day and night, any time a student is here and will enjoy the physical surroundings of his spiritual and intellectual endeavors, he will know that this is thanks to you. You have done something as part of your general benefactions that all of us will always appreciate. And for you, Mr. and Mrs. Gross, you have made a great name for yourselves. You fulfill what King Solomon said. And with this I close, Tov Shem Tov Mi Shem and Tov. Better a good name than good oil. Now, I'm not deprecating good oil, especially in today's market, but Shem Tov is even greater. You've made a great name. It is something we shall always cherish, always admire. On behalf of all our students and our Russia Shiva, on behalf of our board, we offer you our warmest thanks.
Ya Sheikh Kokha. I call now upon Rav Zvulun Khalap, director of our issue. Kvod Moreno Varabeno, Arav Salavechik, Kvod Nesiha Yeshiva, Muram Me'am, Arav Lam, Kvod Roshe HaYeshiva, Talmidei HaYeshiva, Kvod Orchim Nichbodim, Mar Giveres Gus, In remarkable, albeit controversial shot on the Pasuk in Tetzaveh Vil Bashta Osam Es Aron Achicha Les Bonavito Umashachta Osam Umeleisi Es Yodam And you shall clothe them your brother Aaron and his sons Umeleisa Es Yodam and Rashi defines umelesa es yadam kol milu yadayim chinuch wherever the term filling the hands is used it denotes installation initiation kishu nichnos l'davar lios murzek ba me osa yom v'halahu when he enters the thing when he takes hold of it from that day on that's its chinuch that's its initiation that's its installation. We have not gathered here for a Hanukkah Sabayas. For the actual Hanukkah Beit HaMedrash took place several months ago when the first contingent of our Talmudim almost literally broke down the doors to take possession of this Beit Medrash as soon as it became habitable and the new chairs and tables arrived and sat down and learned and the sweet sound of Torah reverberated from this hall. That was its Chanukah Sabayis. It's Miliyodayim, and as the Gemara in Yuma and the Gemara in Shura says, Avodasa Mechan Chaso. Its use was its initiation. And the, the true Chanukah Spesa Medrash is signified as soon as it begins to function. As in Chinuch Beis HaMedrash is when the Beis HaMedrash becomes the throbbing and vibrant hub of Torah Chinuch. There's another interpretation of a Mileis Es Yodam found in the Sfano, which is equally appropriate for this landmark moment in our yeshiva history. Tashlemosa Be'inyon Shetia Shlema Ru'uyo Lavod Avodas HaKodesh Complete it so that it will be ready in its entirety to do its hallowed work. Mr. Joseph Gruss is that inimitable nugget in Israel who undertakes to do the whole thing, who leaves nothing out and nothing to chance. The furniture, the lockers, the bookcases, as well as the chairs and the tables, and the doors, as well as the three classrooms opposite, rich in the learning and law of our yeshiva, and indeed of Torah throughout the world this past half century and more. He saw to it, and it is altogether characteristic of him, that to the last pitchet here, Shlema Uruuya Lavod Avodas HaKodesh. It is to mark the Chanukah Space HaMedrash that you, Talmidim, affected by your learning here. And it is to express our profoundest appreciation to Mr. Gruss, who made our base medrash Shlema Uruuya Lavod Avodas HaKodesh that we have come together this morning. May this base medrash remain for years to come at Bia Sagoel, the happy and fructifying Makam Torah, Yom Valayla, day and night that it is. And may Mr. and Mrs. Gruss reap the large and healthy share of this Chus Torah that is indubitably theirs. Mr. and Mrs. Gruss requested that we invite their rabbis 
to be present and they are here but one of their rabbis their rebbe as he is ours was here already and for us it is as it is for them a great honor for me to ask Moreno Verabeno Rabbi Yosef Dovalevi Salavechik to speak a few words means in the area of Jewish scholarship. We all say every Saturday afternoon following the recital of the Mincha prayer we say the famous, we pronounce the famous state, the famous dictum Moshe Kibbut Torah Messinai and Messorah Yeshua. Moshe received the Torah from the Almighty on the Mount Sinai and he passed it on and handed it down to Yeshua and his disciples. Torah knowledge originated in Sinai and has been passed on from generation to generation, from scholar to scholar, from individual to an individual. Throughout the centuries and the millennia. If you will ask me what is the quintessence of Jewish history, I will tell you Jewish history resolves around one relationship teacher and disciple. Rave Talmud. Moses himself is not known to us as a as a liberator, as a, as a redeemer, as king, as archpriest, but as our teacher. One generation teaches, another generation listens. What does the one generation teach? A variety of things. Truths, verities, norms, laws, Moreover, he teaches a method, a method, a method of understanding the world, and a method of a lifestyle, how to live. In a word, there is a continuity of thought, concept, and one generation is responsible, and as teacher, another generation as a, as a disciple. In a word, it is a scholastic rabbinic masora. Masora teacher and rabbi talmud of teacher and disciple. However, I believe and I firmly believe in that there is another masora of great significance and now limited relevance namely the Masora or the tradition or the practical tradition or the lifestyle of the Jewish layman. And let me not play around with the word layman whose significance I don't understand so well 
and substitute for Lena in the word Balabur. A stranger word, philologically strange, semantically strange, and it, the history of the, of the word is unknown. It's a mystery. Does it mean Balabur? Balabur it means one who owns a house. No, but as a type, as a representative of the people, what does it mean, Balabai? I don't know, I can tell you, I'm not a philologist in general, and particularly even philologists we don't know at all. But let me speak about it without knowing the origin of the word. Let us speak about the Balabos as a person, a personality. In contrast with the scholastic, the practical tradition is not one of concepts, abstractions, thoughts, methods, laws, norms. The practical tradition is one of images, of something, a continuity of something which I see, I feel, and I can stretch out, reach, reach out for it. It is a tradition of a lifestyle, of, of action, it's a personality tradition. This tradition goes back, can be traced back to antiquity. If you ask me who was the first Yiddish Balabos Bala in his yes, he was a prime minister, he did not make a living as a rabbi. He was a prime minister. In, uh, in Egypt, in, uh, we, uh, and they, on the other hand, the leader of the base, that Jacob, of the house of Jacob, which came to Egypt because of the family. It goes back to the so-called Yapire Yerushalayim, the aristocrats of Jerusalem, before the destruction of the temple. The Talmud tells many stories. about the people in Jerusalem, the Akira Yerushalayim, the aristocrats, the noblemen of Jerusalem, who young people now did not retire, did not go to bed, because the King Godel was alone in isolation, and they wanted to make the King Godel feel there are people who have compassion for him, who are ready to help him. So this is the people of the great day of the King Godel. And there are people, and make him feel hopeful, and give him courage to carry on the way of the Those are the Yekira Yerushalayim. The Yekira Yerushalayim were very ashamed in their life. The Aristocrat of Jerusalem did not go to them. Because he should reach back in God in order that he should hear, hear the noise. And he would not fall asleep, he would not be bored and fall asleep. We tell stories, and the, the Jewish people, the people of we, uh, people of story, tells which has the ability of storytelling. It was developed and reached its, its climax in the Hasidic world. But storytelling is a part of, is, is a unique talent of the Jew. In our, our stories, we tell stories not only about great rabbinic scholars, but also about outstanding ballet battle, particularly ballet scholars. We know, for instance, of the Gaon of Europe, the greatest scholar of the 18th century. But we also know about a Balabos in Europe, whose name was Rebe Rebeas. And we have very nice stories about it, about his lifestyle, his, his personality, his kindness. Rebe Rebeas was a merchant, and just a contemporary of the government. As a matter of fact, it is not easy, because it's not easy to become a scholar. It's not easy to become a genius in Jewish Balabas. It's not easy. It's very difficult. 
The Balabhaspara is exposed to more temptation than this power. And the Balabhas needs a lot of courage. I would say Rabbi Lalam mentioned the word heroic effort. He has to make a heroic effort in order to retain the title it's in, of Balabhas. Of Balabhas. And in my opinion, I'm inclined to believe that our miraculous survival throughout the ages in the past and the millennia, our miraculous survival through the dark ages, our miraculous survival through the long, lonely night of Galut, is due not only to the rabbinic scholars, certainly due to them, they guided us, they told us what to do, and now the act, but it's also due to the Jewish Barabbas, to his discipline, his intelligence, and his readiness to suffer. Without the Barabbas, this unique type, I doubt whether we would have, we, we would have survived. By Yolen Shom Balaylahu, and he slept and, and he stayed and he spent a lonely night. And the rabbi, the, rabbi, the scholar, and the balabais are responsible. But we we so much. You ask me, and then it, uh, I can see not only hear the question, I can see the question. I only see. You will ask me, what did those Balabatim possess? We wrote many books about the our scholar. There so many books about my mind, about Nachmanides, about the Dalai Vilna, about the kind of logic, about, about the Haber, the Amor. More or less, we, we are oriented as far as they are concerned. But very little has been, was written about the Jewish Balabat. Very little. Historians not that interested at all. So if you, somebody should ask me, what did the Balabas possess that was characteristic of the important role that was responsible for the important role the Balabas played in Jewish history? What was unique about it? What was unique? I believe that the Balabas, the Balabas, the Yiddish Balabas, distinguished himself with three characteristic traits. He had, I would say, three capabilities. First capability, or first rather, first trait of character, is the Balabas had a sense of unlimited responsibility. At the highest level, he had a clear awareness to use a Talmudic phrase, call Israel a red in He had a clear awareness of his responsibility, not only for himself or his family, but for the entire Jewish community. And not only for the Jewish community in his town, but for the entire Jewish community throughout the world. And it was not just a sense of responsibility, he discharged his duty. Second, the Jewish Balabas had a tough, pragmatic mind. Tough mind. They thought, I mean, the Balabatim thought strictly in utilitarian practical categories and terms. They had also a capability for decision making, and they had unlimited capability for decision implementing. Otherwise, if they hadn't had those capabilities, they would have not they would have not reached the top. They did. They did reach the economy. Third, and it will sound like non nonsensical, absurd. 
He also had, he had not only a tough mind, but he had a sensitive heart. Can a person be both at the same time? Can a person be both at the same time? Oh, it is uh, nonsensical to expect a person to be both. I don't know, psychologically, I don't know if it's possible or not. To be tough and to be a dreamer. To have a utilitarian mind, a pragmatic approach to the world, at the same time a visionary. Looking up to the stars. A Jewish Balabak in the world. They combine the thesis and the antithesis. And somehow, this thesis and antithesis found the synthesis in their personality. It was a dialectical personality. The Jewish Balabas represented two opposites. Toughness was very hard to, 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 to cheat him. Even our, our enemies knew about it. It's very hard to cheat a Jew, and it is true, and we don't have to defend ourselves. It is hard to cheat a Jew. Tough mind, very consistent. The Jew always analyzes, the, this is our method in Talmud. Our analysis in, is in depth. And at the same time, the Jew is a dreamer, a vision. He lifts up his head to the stars, to the mountains. And in addition to, to the sensitivity of the heart and the dream which you can see in his eyes, the Jew and the Jewish Balabas had unshakable faith in redemption of the people and the salvation of the people. You will ask me, from whom did they inherit those Jewish Balabati, these basic qualities, to be tough and to be a dreamer at the same time? As I told you before, they inherited it from the first Jewish Balabas, Joseph. What was so characteristic about Joseph? How does the Bible portray Joseph? What kind of a person he was? He was a funny person. He used to dream of sheaves, sheaves of corn. We are binding sheaves, malmi malumin, we are binding sheaves. Very prosaic dream, very prosaic dream, a practical dream. And at the same time, he dreamt about stars. <coughs> in the sky, but the un, I would say the endless distance of the uncharted lanes in the world, in, in the universe, somehow he dreamt about, about stuff. And apparently, there were, and both dreams did not run, even though mutually exclusive, but still found their synthesis in the personality of of Jacob, of Joseph. Now let me tell you something which happened 14 years ago. Mrs. Solovich is a friend of the brother. I and Mrs. Solovich and I, myself, met Mr. Bruce 14 or 15 years ago, I don't remember exactly, for the first time. I asked for an appointment, they gave me an appointment, but he came himself. I, I was ready to go to see him, but he came, spent not a long time, so Mr. Bruce is not a boy, and Mr. Bruce is a businessman, to the point, in a short time, I could say half an hour, and it worked out. After he, de he departed, so Mr. Solovechik said to me, for the first time I met in America a Jewish Balabas. He just walked in into our house from the pages of Jewish history, from the pantheon of the Balabas. The Jewish history. The Balabas in here. The Jewish history is a story of the Jewish Balabas. She 
was right. In her characterization of Mr. Bruce. Whenever I meet him, I am indeed reminded quite often, you and you, spontaneously, of the outstanding Balabatim in our history. The names of the Moses Montefiore comes to my mind when I see Mr. Bruce. The name of an Anshul Rothschild, the so-called that the Jews in the theater called in Eastern Europe, but from a Rothschild. I'll tell you frankly, Mr. Bruce gives more, gave more money to Jewish fathers than Montefiore and Anshul Rothschild taken together. It's not, a, it's not an exaggeration. But the amount is Mr. Bruce distributes such a and and his intention and he, and with regard to the future is uh, far superior to all the philanthropy work which which uh, Montefiore or Anshu Rashu Sometimes the names those names come up in my mind and sometimes I whisper, I pronounce them in undertone. Here comes Moisha Mandukya. I cannot restrain myself from pronouncing those names in undertone. And Mr. Gus in day indeed, and there's no flattery and no panegyric on my part, I mean what I say is true. I mean, Mr. Bruce reflects something of those Balabatim, of the Yos Yesi Favor. His name happens to be Yesi, Joseph. But he reflects something of Joseph Favor, antiquity. May Almi Malumi, a businessman, I don't know what, what, what he sells, I don't know yet. <laughs> Mr. Gruss reflects something of those Balabatim which he inherited from Yosef at all. First of all, there's a tremendous, I would say sometimes, a tremendous sense of responsibility, of concern. I hardly, I have hardly met another person who is as concerned as Mr. Gruss about whom? About the Jew, about the Jews, what will happen to us, to him, what will happen to all of us. His concern, I mean, I believe it takes up, uh, this concern takes up more time than his business uh, transaction. He is concerned, I mean, whenever, whenever he comes to me, so he has a plan, what to do, how to do. But he is concerned. By Yara de Shem, he saw little as God says, so that Moses is concerned. Many people pass by the snare, the burning bush, didn't pay attention. They did not see the miracle, Madua Leviva Hasne. Why wasn't the bush consumed by fire? It was no problem to them. They, it's a bush, you know, that's all. But Moses passed by, and Moses says, the Suram Novere, let me depart from the path, from the, my, my path, from the highway. Let me take a look. Madua Leviva Hasne, why? Hasn't the snare being consumed by the Falkum and Hall of 25 for 50 years? And still, I mean, the snare is still, still in existence. It was not consumed by fire. This is the, this is the central question which Mr. Bruce has on it. With Mr. Bruce, I mean, is concerned. What can be done as lady does? What can be done? What can be done? What can we do? What can everybody do? Each individual, lay Those nations should have been consumed by fire, I mean, in 1945. We expect. I mean, a Jew should finally realize that there is no, I mean, we were afraid that the Jew will finally realize there is no sense, there is no meaning to our existence. We have been exterminated like, uh, like insects. And still, I mean, the great miracle happened between 45 and 
79. We have a new generation of Jews committed to it. The yeshivas are, are, are crowded with, with, with students. I mean. We have many observant Jews. We would like to have more. But it's a very impressive picture. It's Madua the Yivra Sneu. Why wasn't that Sneu concealed by fire? And Mr. Gruzzi wants to know exactly what should be done and what could be done in order to guarantee the survival of this particular bush. There's no doubt about it that he's a responsible person and very, very concerned. He does care. Now, he certainly has a tough mind. To quarrel with him, I would not recommend. <laughs> tough. I don't know in business, but, but I believe he's tough in business. He's on the one hand a tough businessman, and apparently, I don't know, a great lum as a businessman. I would say a genius in the area, in the area of the mercantile life. I'm not, I'm not an expert on that, so I cannot tell you whether he's a good merchant or not. But the results show that it is pretty good. <laughs> He is mealmi malumim. He is a binder of sheaves. But the same Gruss with the tough mind, and with the mercantile approach to certain matters, pragmatic utilitarian, he is also a visionary. Very imaginative. I, as a role, I lack imagination. But he is very imaginative. His idea, his ideas are dreams. He, beho he beholds visions. The second dream of Joseph, in Hashem Eshvayoreach Vachadaslat Yechovim, the sun and the moon, the eleven stars, bow to me, is also a dream of Mr. Yosef Kuz, not of only of the old Joseph, but of Mr. Yosef Shor Kuz, who lives on Fifth Avenue in New York. And all that, and his greatest dream is survival of our people. And whatever he did in Alexis Royal in the United States, whatever he did here, is to express his, his dream, represents his dream, is the question, a question of the dreamer. What could be done, what could we do in order to survive? May the Almighty. Grant him and Mrs. Bruce was a large share, a big share, in all the good which Mr. Bruce does. May the Almighty grant both many, many years of being tough and dreaming. And let the dream be fulfilled. May we ask you to be seated for just a few more moments. I, I know that all of us are overwhelmed by the beautiful words spoken by the Rev. I know particularly the students would like to hear from Mr. Gruss the secret of it all. Not merely the mialmi malumim, but to see the Shemesh and the Yareach and the Kochavim, to look up to the stars and to have the kind of vision which he had, which has associated his name with this yeshiva, as it has with many, 
But with this yeshiva in particular, and the Russia yeshiva still remember the days when the Gruss supplement enabled them to, with dignity, conduct their lives, even as the many students who have benefited from the Gruss benefactions remember and will Gruss. And so it is proper that we conclude with a word spoken by a student, we hope a word spoken by Mr. Gruss as well. I'd like to pay tribute to all of the students who have helped in terms of the Besa Medrash. We had to move all of this for him out and then back and they were all inconvenienced and yet I want to pay tribute to the president of the SOI, to Mr. Kaysman and to his entire staff who helped. And the new president of the SOI is going to be speaking a few words to us, and so I'm pleased to call upon him and to thank him for his help as well, Zach Novosar. Our Talmud states that Chosh Barosho Yasok Batoro, a person who aches or feels melancholy and depressed, should study Torah, and that Torah study will be the remedy. Interestingly, in all of our rabbinic and Talmudic literature, we find the word grus appearing only once, mainly in Targum Lemegillus Esther, where grus is a remedy for melancholy. So we see that grus is synonymous to Torah study, both of which are remedies for melancholy. Mr. and Mrs. Gruss, every night when we finish learning in our newly refurbished Beis Medrash, we will be mindful to direct that prayer to you which the students of Rebbe Ami recited when they completed their day's learning. It reads, Olamecha tira b'chayecha. May you see your world fulfilled in your lifetime. May you merit life eternal and may your ideals persist throughout the generations to come. May your heart be filled with understanding, your mouth speak wisdom, and your tongue give expression to song. May your eyes direct you straight forward and shine with the light of Torah. And may your countenance be as bright as the luminous firmament. May your lips speak knowledge and preach righteousness. And may your steps ever hasten to the place where the words of the Eternal One are heard. Amen. On behalf <laughs> On behalf of all former students of Yeshivas Rabbeinu Yitzchak El Khanan, on behalf of all present students of Yeshivas Rabbeinu Yitzchak El Khanan, and on behalf of all of the future students of our yeshiva, Yeshivas Rabbeinu Yitzchak Elchanan, I am honored to present the certificate of our appreciation marking this moment in the life of the Talmidim of Yeshiva University. It reads, Yeshivas Rabbeinu Yitzchak Elchanan, Rabbi Isaac Elchanan Theological Seminary, on behalf of the Talmidim, we hereby present the certificate of appreciation to Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Gruss on the day of rededication of the Beis HaMedrash in recognition of their devotion and concern for Limit HaTorah and the Talmidei HaYeshiva, May 1979. Turn it around and face it. That's right. Now look up. That's right. Mr. Gross, thank you. Dear friends, Mr. Joseph Gross, Rabbi Yosef Shaul Gross. Rav Soloveitchik, 
Rabbi Lam, Rabbi Miller, ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Gruss and I appreciate very much what was told about us, and in great humbleness we thank you. And not to be in competition with the intellects of the speaker, of the main speaker, I like to quote Sir Vincent Churchill. There are two kinds of speeches, a short one and a long one. The short speech is I thank you. And the long speech, I thank you very much. Goodbye. Hashem, you may have a We would like to declare a holiday for today, but you have to get back to class. <laughs> and, and we thank Mr. and Mrs. Groose again, and thank our Rashi Yeshiva and our invited guests, those who are coming to lunch in First Hall 535. And if those of our Rashi Yeshiva who could join us, we would be very pleased to have you. <laughs>